This is survey. Let's go ahead, everybody, and ready to start in just the next minute. I'm like, I'm more in this program than I am. Like, Welcome all of you on Zoom. Especially welcome of our own, Stephanie Allen. And it's a lot about what you've been with. Like experience. Really it's fine. Okay. We're good. I go by Stephanie it. Allen Egbert. And yeah. Yeah. I have more units right now. Rebecca, I want to tell their version. <laughs> and uh, for those of you that don't know, most of you young students, young graduate students, don't know that. Dr. Allen used to be part of our faculty, and she brings a rich experience, maybe more than any of our presenters, in having worked in every sector that exists. Basically um, means I'm continually homeless. <laughs> you're moving to AI and chat GPT next. We got a presentation on that this morning that blew my mind. I think we are. Exciting. Awesome. I <laughs> welcome you. And uh, just before I forget, Yes, you may submit an alternate assignment. And one that I think Nathan suggested that I really like is that if, you know, if, if this is your second semester and you've already done the interview of an alumnus and you've already attended a defense, that this semester you're welcome to do those again, but you're also welcome to go to our YouTube channel and look at a presentation, a seminar presentation that's been recorded from a previous year one that you've not seen. That way you can kind of pick and select which one you're most interested in. Uh, grateful for what I does to keep our YouTube channel populated and filled with these wonderful seminars from years past. Do we have any IPSO announcements? That's it. If you do need more people to sign up for Soup Wednesday over the next few weeks, we, we're very sparse on our soup. So unless you want to starve, just kidding. Yeah, I'd love for you to sign up if you could. Is Heather in here? The conference is this weekend at Heather's. Oh, yes, the U.S. Group is Friday. Friday. And yeah. one of our own is the, the winners, right? Whoa. For Friday. Uh, Richard Claudia is in this week. I, this is her partnership with USU. Anybody want to also announce Richard Claudia's? Um, is it who knows the details on that one more time? Go ahead, Charles. He's presenting um, for the the conference is called Instructional Leadership in the 21st Century. It's a conference that's put on at the Provo Convention Center and sponsored by the, the college, the, the BYU Public School Partnership. And he's one of the keynoters. He'll be presenting tomorrow morning at 10. And is it possible for our students to still go to that or not? I think registration is closed now. Okay. Well, for those of you that don't know, you, you all enjoyed Joseph South's presentation. Richard Collada was actually his his boss in the U.S. government in the Department of Ed. Well, he's one of our. He's his boss now. Is he? Still working. We're still working together. Okay. Yeah, and Richard's also one of our our, our most famous alumni. Well, very good. Oh, go ahead, please. I just wanted to remind everybody that tonight at seven, right, is our project fair. And this is something that we do for our incoming students, prospective students to help them see what the program is like. Um, so any of you who are employed by the department, you are welcome to come tonight and clock in and be here to answer questions from students. Um, you're also welcome to come if you're not employed by the department. I just can't hear you. And um, we'll have chips and salsa and, um, you know, come support your friends who are presenting at Paramus and- Come support me, please. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so come support your friends and- Thank you so much. Let's start with a word of prayer and, and we all want to support Pam as she prays for us. So, Pam, if you'd get us started this morning. Gracious Heavenly Father, 
grateful for this beautiful day. We're grateful to be able to gather together at BYU and in this department to learn. Pray, Father, that thy spirit may be with us and with Stephanie as she presents. Pray that we may be able to take the things that we have learned and be able to apply them in our studies as well as in our lives and future careers. We pray, Father, for those who are suffering and uh, sick at this time. We pray that thy spirit may be with them. And we say these things humbly in the name of the Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Dr. Allen, time is yours. Um, and we hope as part of your presentation, you'll be introducing your professional journey and well, do an introduction that I couldn't even begin bidding. justice for. <laughs> You're bidding. And um, again, be mindful, Stephanie, if you will, of the number of students that are on. There'll be times that people will actually say there is a question. I'll interrupt you. And so she'll interrupt you in a nice way. Thank you again for making this special trip to be with us and thank the church for allowing you to come. <laughs> Well, I'm grateful, grateful to be here. I have a female voice that sometimes registers right where people can't hear it very well. So I will project, but if it ever you can't hear me or if I'm kind of mumbling a little, just raise your hand and I'll know this happens. Um, so glad to be here. And I am here at Dr. Howell's bidding and I will do a little bit of a professional journey. Uh, not at my request. In fact, I tried to get out of it twice. He wouldn't let me. Um, but uh, hopefully you will see in the journey the opportunities for you. The conversation that I really want you to be thinking about is the response to this quote all day. Have thy tools ready, God will give thee work. I had an amazing professor during my undergraduate. It was her first year teaching, Cynthia Hallen. And this was super old school. Like even at that time, she would put a quote on the board and we would write a free response to it for like the first five or 10 minutes. It was like super like, I don't know, parochial school girl, but the quotes that were so like very compelling. And this is one from my sophomore year that has guided my life's journey. And I've always thought about it. And so if I were to say something to put on my tombstone, I don't know what, I would probably put this one <laughs> because it's, it's really meaningful to me because it has guided my, my life. And it, um, and I hope that you will take this advice of having your tools ready. And we're gonna talk about tools today. And hopefully what you'll see is an opportunity for you to think about how your tools will guide your life, not necessarily how mine have influenced mine. So biological heritage really quickly. For my two parents, they are compelling, eternal instructional designers and educators. I had no hope but to become an instructional designer because of where I came from. And I grew up in the big hair era of the 1980s. So that's my family growing up. My bio, my academic heritage is awesome. I mean, how many people have a five generation sheet? This is my five generation sheet academically. This was taking place here when I was teaching. Um, so David uh, Wiley was my dissertation chair when I did my doctorate. His dissertation chair was Laurie Miller. Hers was Charlie Rigaluth, and then it was David Merrill. And so one time, Charlie uh, Ragaluth was recognized um, in the department here, actually not the department, the college as uh, the honored alumnus. And so when he came, we all got together and had this picture. And uh, I was blessed to be at Utah State during a time when I got to be with the three that are exactly surrounding me and take classes from each one of them, which is pretty amazing. And um, of course, like all of us have been influenced by Dr. Ragaluth. Um, this is my current family. Later in life, I got married to David Egbert, who uh, is his own right and an, an educational technologist. For years, he worked in the Center for Teaching and Learning, uh, and I inherited four wonderful stepchildren with him. We've added a few, so you can see this is kind of our family at present, but super glad to be a part of the Egbert family. Uh, I, I went back through uh, the course list just recently in the master's and, and doctoral program and pulled out this is, of course, my bias, the tools that you are developing here in your classes, the tools that you're being taught. These are everything from soft skills to hard skills, variety. You could probably add a whole bunch to this, but these are things that I felt, wow, this is an amazing tool set that you are developing and you're gaining here. And uh, the one on the bottom right, the seeking and receiving revelation is amazing and that's unique to BYU. That that's part of your, your classes. It's part of what you're invited to do every day. It's what I hope you take with you every day of your life going forward. We'll talk about that a little bit more, but um, this is an amazing skill set. And because of that, 
this is where you end up. This is, this is just literally a snapshot of the people that I know, friends and, and colleagues and former students and where they are. Everything ranging from entrepreneurs to authors to CEOs to chief technology officers, you literally can go anywhere. Um, I remember when I graduated undergraduate, I wasn't a humanities, but I was in the College of Humanities and I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry, you'll never have a job because you're a humanities major. And I'm like, are you kidding me? The world is open to me. I know how to write. I know how to think. I know how to do you know? And then leaving here because of the tool set that you have, literally, again, the world is open to you. You can be any of these things and more. Um, and um, the range, it's just awesome. This is the best career in the whole world. Um, so when, when Dr. Hal um, talked to me, this is based on that quote. This is the, the question that I want you to think about today. How will your tools, these tools you're developing, how will they help you in your work and in your life? This is the Instagram. This is the, this is the polished version of my professional journey. I love this. It looks so great. It's not what happened. <laughs> but it looks like I had these really distinct chapters. I started at agency work. I came here and did some academic work, both in IPT and then later at the Center for Teaching and Learning. Then I went to church and I worked on digital media strategy, emerging technologies, and then I did education support for developing countries, kind of a more broader thing. But really, this is what it looks like. <laughs> it's more like this. Lots of deviations, lots of turns, ups and downs, uh, different domains, and a little bit compelling. <laughs> I think the thing I love most is problems to solve. There's so many out there. And sometimes I get an opportunity to consider one and everyone's like, would you do that? I'm like, I don't know. It just sounds really interesting. <laughs> and so, so this is more of the version that, that you will see today is what, what really happened. Um, from the tool set that we talked about and the tools you're developing, all you faculty in the back, I'm so happy to see you. I just love you all. I <laughs> just wanted to pause. Thank you for being here. Thank you for being an important part of my life. I love all of you. Um, These are tools that you will use every day, every day of your life. Home, family, profession, callings. I, I don't even care what context. These are the tools that I think you'll use every day. Um, problems always are around you. Communication and seeking and receiving revelation. One of the things that I've learned the most have people give me disclaimers because they work, they know I work at the church and they're like, I really feel like I'm guided in my work, even though I don't work at the church. I'm like, of course you're guided in your work. It has nothing to do with working for the church. Don't think that I think that working at the church has the corner on revelation. Like that's ridiculous. Every day of your life in every facet, you um, need to seek and receive revelation. There's a, there's a, if you follow, well, sorry, that sounds weird. If you follow Elder Bednar, that's weird, right? But if you follow Elder Bednar's teachings, more and more he talks about he always gets the question like, was it my voice or is it the spirit guiding me? How do I know? And he's like, who cares? If it's something good, just do it. You need to live in revelation. I heard him say it just a couple of weeks ago, again, to the students at Enzyme College, the same concept of like, you just, you just, it's not like I'm pausing, I'm waiting right now to receive revelation. You should be on a continual conveyor belt of receiving revelation all the way along through your life. So. I, ex I expect that of you. I hope that for you. I plan on that being your lives. And it certainly has been an important part. These things are the, the default tool set. If I have to like minimize and get down to three, these are the ones I would like to take with me wherever I go. Um, I started Allen Communication. There is a connection to my name and this company. Um, my dad and uncle started it in the 80s. It was back in the day when only really uh, rich <laughs> companies in terms of the government and Fortune 500 companies could afford using what was then computer-based or multimedia-based training. And so there were some really interesting projects working on everything from the Air Force to the Department of Defense to, I worked on some for Prudential Securities and Alaska Pipelines and different kinds of things. There was a certain Allen way. We talk about it in the Allen way, and I'm actually 
going through lots of mementos this last couple of weeks, pulled out bins and boxes from my basement. And I found the handbook of the Allen way. And I can't throw that away. <laughs> it's just like, and they, everyone's going to look at it when I die and they're going to be like, that's weird. And they're going to throw it away. But I can't because there was this Allen way. And the most important thing that I learned, uh, by the way, this is sorry, instructional design. These are the tools that were on the list that I'm going to pull out. I'm sorry, I should have said that. My focus here, the tool I want you to think about that I learned at Allen Communication was audience-centered design. We literally were asked, maybe compelled, you'd sit in your cubicle, you'd have your monitor in front of you, and you had a picture of the audience for whom you were creating whatever the instructional or job aid or resource was there. It was like right in front of you every day, all day long. And you were writing for them. And we did really extensive needs analysis and audience analysis up front. Um, traveled more than most because we wanted to be in their environment. We wanted to talk to them face to face. There weren't technologies that there are now to do Zoom calls and see people in context. And, and so we did really a lot of, of travel, which helped a lot, was really interesting. Um, many amazing things happened as a result of instructional centered design. I'm going to tell you about an epic fail. <laughs> so... This is mine. I took the lead on this. I was completely mortified by this, but I just, sometimes non-examples are as compelling or maybe more so than, than examples. So um, I'm working for Tesoro. We are doing doc operations and a doc safety and security course, not the most compelling content, as you can imagine. Um, like lots of regulations, lots of stipulations. You can't have this five feet away from this. And so we had done a ton of really interesting scenario-based, simulation-based, gamified kind of things for these operators. And they looked like this, like they were big, burly guys. And I don't mean to be like any sort of politically incorrectness. Like these were the guys, they were just like wonderful guys. And we would go in a little tin, you said I have a pointer, right there. Like these little tin sheds were like where they would go to do, we went on site down in the Gulf of Mexico and we were, we were doing an alpha test for them. And with them, here's our, you know, we literally brought, brought the computers into these little tough shed kind of things. And we're sitting down side by side with them. And the first guy that I went through this course with turned to me and he didn't say anything. He didn't know what to do. Yeah, and we, I'm like, oh, click here, go forward a little bit, blah, blah, blah. And like about 32 seconds into this conversation, I'm like, can't read. It never occurred to me that an adult in the United States would not be able to, like literally never occurred to me. And I was devastated and terrified and trying to figure out how to rectify this situation so he didn't feel like an idiot, right? That's not the goal. And so in my mind, immediately I'm like backpedaling and I'm like, oh, oh, I'm so sorry. The text is so small. This is such a terrible design. Let me just read it for you. Let's just, let's just sit down together and we'll go through the course together. And, and that happened several times during the day, wasn't the only one. Because, you know, on our part, we came back, we revisited, we added audio, we did a lot of things, simplified greatly the text. You can imagine the importance of audience-centered design. Um, there were lots of really wonderful experiences of that. This one is poignant to me always because it was a time when we didn't really do the homework to the extent that we needed to. And just be prepared for the unexpected, like. That was an assumption I thought was a, like an easy assumption, but it, and it turned out not to be. I've since learned that that's one of those assumptions I would never replicate now. Um, I next took my next detour. No, this is my first detour. So my first detour was to go to Jepson Sanderson. And um, they were an aviation information company. They do, and they still do all the charts and the maps that all the commercial airlines do. Um, Anytime you get on a plane, they do the weather, they do the, they do the flight plan, they do the charting, and they also have a really robust training program. This is what the training program looked like when I got there. Tons of wonderful books, little flight computers, little log book of your hours, a little Jepson bag. And they said, um, this is what we're going to talk about here, listening and team building. Here's our focus. And they said, we are the best in the industry. Everybody knows us. Everybody wants to do JEP training, but there's this new stuff like multimedia. And we think because this is we do maneuvers, <laughs> we do flight plans, that it would be really compelling 
to do some multimedia training. So we'd like to invite you to join our team. We're hiring an instructional designer. And so would you come and join our coursework team? I applied. They didn't invite me. Like I wasn't that sorry. That makes it sound way better than it was. I applied. And um, they said, great, we need it. We need an instructional designer. There was about 35 people. Every one of them, minus the graphic designers and the programmers, every single one of them was not only a pilot, but a flight instructor, aviation aficionado, like Pilots love flying <laughs> and, and they had no respect for me. I don't even mean respect. They had no reason for my existence. <laughs> like it was, it was bad. <laughs> like, and I was like, Oh, I'm, I'm just here to help. Like, can I help? And they're just like, literally like silence. Don't spend time with you. Won't even talk to you. Don't have a need for instructional designers. And I'm like, oh, I just moved here to Denver for this job. I, I think that the boss wants me to be here, but nobody else will talk to me. I don't know what to do. Probably one of the darkest moments of my life for about six months. <laughs> and, and so I thought, well, okay, I'm not going to get anything done anyway. They won't let me work on the project. So, so one by one, I started asking if I could come and listen to them in their cubicle and just hear about what they've done, the projects they've done, what they love about the training that they've developed uh, and maybe what they wish they could do. And little by little, by little, by little, um, literally six months, Finally, we were breaking down barriers and they're like, well, we'd really love to be able to visualize some of these things. We love our students to be able to practice some of these things. And we'd love, and we can't do it because we got this two-dimensional text, right? <laughs> you can do really great visuals in a text, but you can't manipulate it. And so I was there for three years and over time, this is what it looks like now. We didn't, we didn't have super cool iPads, but we did have computers. And we started doing like CD-ROMs of these amazing maneuvers and different kinds of training. So we did private pilot and multi-engine and uh, all sorts of simulations that were just really, really fun. And by the time I left, we had teams of instructional designers and developers and like we call subject matter experts, like sitting together and, and working collaboratively on these things and really loving the exchange and the gifts and the talents and capabilities that each one of those brought to the table. So we, like I really just emphasize too, sometimes listening is not just to the clients and the customers, but also to the teams, the coworkers, the people that you work with to find out how, what are the gifts you bring? What are the talents you bring? What are the limitations you feel like could be overcome or where are the gaps? and um, miracles can happen. Um, I think this is safe to say at BYU. I started, in the end, I got invited to happy hour. And I thought that was a huge win. Because I was like, because I'm like, oh my gosh, this program programmers, like they like me. Well, I don't know what they like, but they're like me enough to invite me to happy hour. And I learned two things about happy hour. Like they're not one hour. <laughs> it's like, oh my gosh, I have to drink this lemonade super slow. <laughs> it just like it was like three hours. And I remember kept like, oh don't look at your watch. Like, why are we still here? But <laughs> oh, so but also happy hours aren't about drinking. Happy hour was about relationships and conversations and families and getting into the gray part of life and changing. The relationship among coworkers. Um, I didn't have people that were like hardcore drinking, you know, like that that makes a difference. But but it was really a connecting, wonderful experience. And and so to me, that was the moment that I was like, I've arrived, I got invited to happy hour. I was so excited and grateful to be there. Um, still to this day, people that I revere and respect so greatly. If I hadn't moved back, I would be a pilot right now because <laughs> I was just getting ready 
to sign up for pilot license when my life changed and I ended up coming back to Utah. Oh, grateful for this time, grateful for the opportunity to listen and learn. Then I came here, so excited. And so I also had never planned in my life to be a professor. These are some of my little favorite students, Donna and Megan and Stephen. They were a trio that we worked on some, some advanced instructional design projects together. The reason I have these two skills up here, uh, you're like, well, I hope you already have learned these if you were here, <laughs> is that the process of teaching about instructional design and teaching about project management made me a way better instructional designer and made me a much better project manager. And so I encourage you, whenever you have the opportunity to teach the tools and teach the skills, to embrace it. Um, because you know this, it's just like becoming a doc gospel doctrine teacher or teaching any lesson. You know it better, you learn it better, you find it more compelling because you've done the work at that. So had some wonderful experiences. Uh, Dr. Graham and I came together. We were one year, he was just a, a semester ahead of me. Um, and so we started together and he has a much more sequitur career than I would. So grateful and grateful for that beginning and foundation together. Uh, some of your professors ironically were in our classes um, <laughs> and we're so glad you're here and back. And I met Stephanie at the time because she was right up here in the program. So glad you're now in, in classes and taking this. So. Um, what I also learned, of course, right, all these things, research methodologies, learning theory, all of those were reinforced, uh, strengthened my evaluation just by associating with those whose life and breath evolved around measurement and evaluation. But these are the things that I will always remember and be grateful for and take from here. Um, eventually, I got to the church. Uh, there were a couple of tangents in between. Um, at first, when I went there, I was invited to lead a team of instructional designers and project managers in what was then the uh, audiovisual department, now publishing services. I think publishing really broad, like everything from texts to websites to broadcasts. Um, but then they asked me to, if I would take the lead on an emerging technologies team. And uh, this is a gap right here for me. I just want you to know of instructional technology, my degrees in instructional technology. I am an instructionalist. I don't consider myself a deep technologist. Uh, and so when they invited me to participate and lead this team, I was terrified. Like the whole time I was there because I'm like, they're gonna see I'm so fraudulent. It's, this is gonna be an epic fail again. Um, didn't fail because we brought in really great people. And each of them came with expertise in a technology. So this is like the turn of the 19th century. We were streaming general conference for the first time. My team did general conference streaming for the first time. And we were at the conference center for like 22 hours or two or three consecutive days because everything was being done manually and we were trying to figure things out. And we were doing social media for the church for the first time, if you can think back to that. And, and, and then they were doing the Mormon channel, which is now like merged and integrated into the Saints channel, but wanting to bring to members, can't see this is really small, but like in four different platforms, content. So it was Roku box and it was mobile and it was internet and it was radio. And we were trying to figure out if you could do a solution I mean, this is totally normal now, right? To have these multimodal learning experiences, but it wasn't back then. And so um, what, I, what I learned from this is you don't have to be strong in your tools. You have to be enough, savvy enough to, to ask questions like, and hire well. <laughs> this is really important is to hire well, ask questions and hire well. There were so many times um, and I'm sorry for the team members. There were times when we would be grappling with something. I would say my prayers. I would go to bed. I'd be like, get up the next morning, like repeatedly. This is not one day, but like for weeks on end and get nothing. And then the next morning we'd get to work and Bob would come into me. He's like, I couldn't sleep all night. I was up all night and I it just couldn't stop thinking about this. And I think I have a solution. And I'm like, I'm <laughs> Oh, great. Or somebody would say, I ran into this guy in the, in the elevator 
and he's looking at this from this perspective and it's IT and we could, I think we could do it this way. And so, I mean, Heavenly Father knew I was not the receptor, right? I could be playing, praying all day long to understand how to do these solutions. I was not going to get it. <laughs> he knew that was, I was not the receptor, but all of my team members, I mean, it happened so many times it was uncanny. Like, I, I mean, I literally couldn't help finding like, just like delight in their pain of staying up at night because God would use them as receptors, figure out these technology advances and to figure out what is this, how does the church use this technology and where do we go with this and what are the parameters and what are the issues and what are the constraints and um, so many great experiences here. Um, but it's okay to not have strong tools in every capacity. I guess I just want to say that. And I realize that I'm using myself as a non-example lots of times. That's okay. I'm okay with that. But this is one of them where I was so grateful just to know enough to be dangerous and then bring in really smart people around you to shore up your, your weaknesses. Um, public affairs or public publishing services is great when you work for them. It's like working for an agency because you support all the different departments in the church. So the next thing I did was I led a team that supported public affairs and this skill, this tool that we're talking about is negotiation. Um, so public affairs is the newsroom of the church. And as you can imagine, the newsroom wants to be the first to tell the church's story. Like that's obvious. And yet I worked for the constraints team with policies and processes that said everything that gets published from the church has to go through these five steps or these five re review processes before it gets published. And I'm sorry that you want to publish, be the first ones to talk about the missionary lower age, but we got to go through all these approvals before you can publish. Anyway, it wasn't super pleasant experience a lot of times. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you a little personal aside that's kind of funny. Um, but we were doing, you know, press releases, news releases, press conferences, where they would say to me, you need to have a press conference ready. I can't tell you anything about it, but you need to have a team in place because we don't want to tell you because we're afraid it will leak out to the public. And I'm like, well, can you give us some parameters, <laughs> you know, just so that we, so it was a constant negotiation. We, we did make some major progress. Like I actually sided with public affairs and saying, you know, if the church isn't going to get out the message first, you're going to hear it from dissidents. You're going to hear it from everybody from well-intended, but you know, misinformed to people that are actually trying to, you know, negatively impact the reputation of the church. And so we had to do a lot of negotiation constantly. Like, I remember like, correlation, can you come and sit at the table in public affairs and publishing services and let's talk together and be friends and figure out a way so that we can do some streamlined publishing. Um, and that, it it worked It in, in, in large measure, things are better, not because of me, but because of the process, because of the negotiation. And, and getting to the right solution. But it was really fun to put together a press conferences and say, well, at least tell me how many people, how many cameras, how many, how many chairs do we set up? You know, those kinds of things. It literally would be, this was when uh, Elder Rasband, Elder Stevenson and Elder Renlund were called to the Quorum of the Twelve. And this was between conference sessions. There was a, a press release or press conference and we had and with all the press sitting here and asking questions and that's the managing director of public affairs. But um, uh, boy, did we have fun, and boy, did I learn a lot about negotiation <laughs> during that era of life. Here's the funny personal side note. Um, I'm a fairly healthy person. I exercise, I eat. When I had this job, I'd go in for my annual exams, and they're like, your heart rate, your blood pressure, and your heart rate is off the charts. What are you doing wrong? And I'm like, I don't know. I haven't changed anything. And I go in and they'd have him come back like two months later. It would still be like my birth blood pressure would be extremely high. And then I went two months after I left this job and everything was back to normal. <laughs> it was completely circumstantial. <laughs> um, anyway, I also got married during that time. So I'm like, I don't even remember for about a year. Um, but anyway, it was just kind of funny. So I always laugh about that period of like, oh yeah, that's the high blood pressure era. Um, <laughs> and part of it was just this constant, like literally this constant negotiation and trying to figure out the right solution in very, um, I mean, this was, this was the ordained women era. This was the Mitt Romney running for president. There was a lot of things that were going on, um, that were high profile that 
So it was really exciting. Um, and, and all the things that we did were really compelling, um, but it was kind of an interesting journey to be a part of that. So this is my second to last landing. I have a new landing place, but this is the place I wanted to just spend a little more time. Um, from there, I, um, I actually asked for this. I, I learned about uh, Kim Clark became the new commissioner of church education. Um, Gilbert, President Gilbert, Elder Gilbert is now that in that role. But at the time, this was um, Elder Kim Clark, who had come from BYU Idaho as the president there and had done Pathway, right? So everybody knows about Pathway, Pathway Connect officially, but he had done that saying, we need educational support for people who want to go to college, but need that bridge to get them there. And so he came into the commissioner's office and he said, what can we do for, for youth? What can we do for children? We have tons and tons of children in school, but not at grade level. And so there wasn't even a name for it. It since kind of became the global education initiative, but there wasn't a name. It was just a concept of providing support for kids after school education support for kids in developing countries. And I heard that address like a little lightning bolt went through my body and I'm like, I want to do that. <laughs> That's what I want to do next. That's what I was like, my whole life has prepared me for this. Really, I don't know if I had, but I wanted to do that so badly. So I went into his assistant and I just asked to help. And um, I, miracle of miracles, months later, there I was on the team. And it was an amazing journey, starting from nothing to the emphasis here is the tool was product development. We literally started from scratch. We had no idea what was needed. Spent a lot of time on the ground. We learned as much as we could from people in developing areas and ended up with this succeed in school product. Um, it's a product focused from kind of 11 to 15 year olds. Again, let me just kind of paint the picture for you. These are students that are going to school. Their desire is to go to school. The schools are very badly resourced, like maybe two textbooks for a, for a classroom. Teachers are sometimes paid, sometimes not. So there are times that they don't show up because they literally have to go do other work to feed their family before they can come back to school. The education, the language of education is not the language spoken at home. So they're doing school in a second language or third or fourth language, depending on how many. Um, and they have just all sorts of challenges, uh, nutrition, different kinds of things. And so um, we decided we we're gonna to try to do after school programs. So they're, they're done by called teachers. So it's just like, I would get a seminary teaching assignment. You get a succeed in school teaching assignment um, and you come two or three days a week after school. And there are two teachers, one teaches reading, writing another teaches math. And the goal is to get these kids to grade level, really eighth grade proficiency, probably in, in reading, writing, speaking, listening, but we talk about reading, writing, mathematics. Um, an amazing experience, an amazing experience. We, product development, like literally, I think we iterated 26 times <laughs> before we got to a product. We'd, we'd try a couple lessons, we'd go out, we'd test them, find out, oh my goodness, this is completely different than we thought. We need to do more, less support. Oh, the teachers don't even, they can't work off of an outline. They need to have a whole script because they, they don't know the subject matter. They're not teachers. Uh, and the students, uh, uh, the chalkboard is so far away and so old, 25 years, that when they write the problem on the board, our supposition was that they could copy it down in their workbooks, but they can't because it's the, the writing on the board is so bad that they're getting the, the, the you know equation wrong in their notebooks and so everything's going badly. Anyway, we've learned so many different things. Um, this is, these are the kids kind of during one of those beta tests. And the goal is, which is very different than school, for them to work together. It's also really different from their school experience. School experiences there are typically, this is Ghana. We were in Haiti, uh, Papua New Guinea, Vanuatu, different, uh, Mexico. But typically school is like rote memorization, lots of recitation, writing from the board, perfect penmanship, perfect grammar, can't speak, can't generate, not creative and not critical thinking. So that's what we were trying to fill the gaps in with. So lots of participation, lots of group work, um, lots of things where they're having to generate answers, which made them all extremely uncomfortable. Here's a couple resulting factors. So this is a just a lesson out of the math 
workbook. Like I said, the workbook just didn't even come into being until like two years into it. Um, but, but we decided we're going to give them vocabulary words because they're not only learning in a second language, but there's also a language of math. Like math has a language, right? So we would teach vocabulary words that they would learn lots of visuals, workspace. So even if they had texts, their text paper was at a premium. So there was no like, like workspace in the books to, to do. So we made sure, I know that sounds like stupid and obvious, but workspace for them to try things out, visuals, helping them. And then in the end, um, we wanted it to be related to the gospel of Jesus Christ always. So even in math, there's a closing that invites them to apply it to their lives or to bring it back and show how this concept or principle is either applicable in everyday life and or applicable to the gospel where possible. So that was, this was just a snapshot of that. Here's a quick snapshot of a, a, a lesson from the reading and writing teacher manual. Again, as I mentioned, not teachers by profession, um, not necessarily the best educated people either. Um, so we, again, learning outcomes, here's the things, there's a discussion always, there's activities, there's closings like we have in the other, but literally scripted out for them. These are the things to say, any italicized, I know you can't see the details, but we would teach classroom management and literally script out for them, walk around, have the kids do groups together, things that probably wouldn't think were needed, but we would need to give guidance and direction on. Um, we ended up using friend articles as the content, which is so fun. So we'd be teaching like transitive verbs and you'd be reading about faith or we'd be teaching sentence structure and it would be an activity about, you know, tithing. And so we, we wanted to integrate the gospel clearly because it's a, a church educational product. But lots of fun, and lots of hard work and super happy with where we ended up on these. Um, this is where I am now. I'm in the missionary department. Of all the deviations, this is the most dramatic. Um, I hope I find out why I'm here. <laughs> um, but I am learning about measurement. <laughs> if there's something that the missionary department does well, they track everything. They track everything from like social media ads to how many baptisms per missionary in each mission, in each area. I'm working with members and how members share the gospel. So here are just two charts that we use all the time. Member referrals per area, like area of the world, and then, then normalized per 10,000. So the otherwise, like they wouldn't be on the same chart, right? So they have to like normalize it per 10,000. So you can see like Africa's doing really great in terms of inviting people to work with the missionaries. And some of us are not doing so great. Utah's at the bottom, but you know, there's for lots of reasons. And then Weekly back for members. So anyway, I'm learning and, and strengthening my tool of measurement and evaluation and outcome assessment, all of those things. Those are the things that I'm learning and, and working through as I'm in the missionary department. Uh, great experience, great stretch assignment for me. So now it comes back to you. This is a little bit about my journey, but really I want you to think about your journey. Where will your tools take you in your work and in your life? I want you to just think about that. Yours will be uniquely yours. It will be guided. Um, but, I, but I want you to think of classes now as opportunities to develop tools so that you don't just box it, compartmentalize it and say, I am done with <laughs> statistics. I'm done with you know, the evaluation, now my favorite class, whatever it might be, but to say, this is, this is part of my toolbox going forward. And I want you to think about all your opportunities in that way. And so this is just my clothing statement. I really do feel like um, this, about this now, I'm not gonna have a tombstone, but if I did, uh, this would literally would be on my tombstone. <laughs> like, have the tools ready, God will give thee work. And I pledge to you, I promise to you that it will be a great work regardless of what you do, regardless of where it takes you, even if you have moments and periods of time in your life where you're not technically employed, all of this, <laughs> everything is a great work. And everything you take with you, all the tools that you develop will be assets to you as you go through. I wish God's blessings upon you and thank you so much for your time.
we have a few more minutes and I'm certain that there'll be some questions. Do we have anything that's come through our chat? Um, I have one quick question on the succeed in school. Sure. We would, that, how's it being used now? And do you see it continuing to grow? Is it readily accessible to the, you know, to some of us that may have occasion to use it um, or is it restricted really to the African nations? Um, that's a great question. It's being debated in the, uh, uh, Debated is the wrong word. Um, the Board of Education has asked for a limited um, version of it. However, every, the books are up and available. You can see if you just go to churchofjesuschrist.org forward slash succeed in school, you can see the teacher manual and the parent manual, and you can see samples of the reading and writing and math teacher guide and student, student workbook. And there are others that are trying to do this everywhere. There's lots of people that are like, we went, I heard of, there's an after school program in Provo, just right, you know, down the street where they're having kids come after and doing homework and help. And so if there's interest in that, I would be so thrilled to connect you back to that team, to have them continually talk with you about how it's going and whether or not those resources can be made available more broadly. It's, it's fantastic. It's a wonderful product. So. Oh, really. We'll be pondering your futures. I'm so excited. Yes, go ahead. It's great you shared about your time at uh, Jepson developing the flight training materials. You mentioned that when you started your team, there were like 34 pilots or whatever. And I it just it, it made me think that we're stuck on a team, stuck on a team with 34 SMEs, right? Like, and and I just wondered if you had any insight about the, you know, how did you value individual insights when there was that much input versus trying to kind of reconcile all the different perspectives that would be thrown at you? Oh, that's a really great. I mean, there were 34, I would say 20 of them were pilots and flight instructors. Ten of them were graphic artists and you know, layout design because they did books, right? And, and then they had hired a couple of programmers to just figure some things out with simulation. But your point is well taken. They weren't all working on the same project at once. Like these guys would be doing multi-engine. These guys would be doing commercial, you know, and these guys would be doing like private pilot license. But they all had to get together, you know, and you do have, I was taught this way and this was my methodology and this was my professor. Or this was my flight instructor. And they said this. And it was interesting to figure out how they would work together and, and sort that out. That wasn't really my job in, in, because, I mean, remember, I wasn't even voted on the island yet. So, but among themselves, they had to work on that. And I think that's a good point to bring up, that you want divergent perspectives, but ultimately somebody has to say, this is the, this is the way we're going to utilize or, or go by that. And um and, and part of that, later on, when we did have instructional designers that came, they started to be like the arbitrators, you know, a little bit like, okay, Pat, you're telling me this, and Liz, you're telling me this, and how, you know, are those really the same thing, but just talking to me differently about it. And so that's a great thing. And I do think that instructional designers do that every day, all day long. That's one of the great things about working with subject matter experts, as well as right, taking an expertise level so high that they don't even know what they don't communicate down to that novice perspective, right? Because they just live and breathe it. And so that's one thing that I love being an instructional designer. I'm like, okay, dumb it down. Dumb, I mean, I'd say that, but like literally bring it down, bring it down so that first time person go back and do the steps again, because somehow there's a disconnect between what I would perceive two and five, you know, good question. Yeah. I hope this isn't an obvious question, but your presentation focused on a lot of tools that you saw that you developed through all of these experiences. Um, what advice would you give for us to help us recognize and perhaps appreciate those tools while we're going through an experience as well as afterwards? It's a great question. <laughs> yeah, because some of those tools I look back and I'm like, oh, I did have those in my classes, <laughs> you know, like, but I didn't have an application for them. Actually, this was interesting. I did my, um, master's degree while I was working full-time. Maybe not the best choice for everybody, but it was super helpful for me because I was working as an instructional designer and then I was learning about instructional design in the evenings and in my night classes. And then like the next day applying it. 
And so I'm not suggesting that works for everybody, but if you can get an opportunity through an internship or, um, or an on-campus, there's plenty of them, right? Um, I, I had lots of students when I was teaching, or sorry, when I was working at the Center for Instructional Design, we had tons of IPNT students and they would be working on projects for faculty members and colleges around the, around the um, campus that were fantastic opportunities to apply and to see like, theory is great, but it can't be super pure because <laughs> it doesn't like play out all the way. And so grappling with that, learning how to do that. I also, uh, and it's really hard to do as a student, but like project forward, like what do I find that like really like jives with me, like that I'm good at, that I really kind of like want to know and learn more about. And then I would look for opportunities and applications where you can use those strengths and, and just say, I'm going to build toward, like, I want to do research methodology. I want to do evaluation. I want to do, I love the design process, that kind of thing. And then just, just really hone your craft that way. Not super the best answer, but hopefully it's a start. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, Melissa. What are your favorite tools? Out of your, all of your experience, what are your favorites? Three that I listed at the top, problem solving, communication, you know, receive and revelation. And I guess. But I'm an instructional designer at heart. I love instructional design. <laughs> I don't mean to be like perfunctory about it. Like, like, like what's really interesting about design, right, is the design process is consistent. Like I remember, this is like so dumb that I didn't know this, but I had somebody that was in like agricultural design or what was it? What's the, what's the landscape design? Or landscape design. And I was like, oh, wait, your design process is the same as my design process. Mine's instructional design, interior design, like the design process, that creative, it doesn't have to be exactly the same model, but that design process of figuring out how to work through is going to bless your life for your it all along because design is, is awesome and rich and it can help you in different things. So I probably would say it designed to that one. We're over time, right? We're, we're just okay. Sorry. Any other questions? Thank you very much. And are you going to stay around for a little bit? Sure. I'd love to. So if there are a couple of you that like to visit uh, after you're, you're welcome to do that. Uh, I'd like uh, Dr. Rich, our chair, to give a quick announcement about next week's unique seminar. And then Tyler, if you give us a, a Causing prayer and a blessing on the, the food. So next week, the seminar is going to be on Thursday at 11 instead of Wednesday at noon. Because uh, next week's seminar is once a year, the College of Education does a, um, a guest lecture. It's actually uh, one of the favorites to our recognitions that they do each year. Uh, somebody comes in from outside the university and they need to give a Benjamin Clock lecture. Uh, this last year, the, this year, uh, I think he was asked to choose the lecture and we invited Dr. Kuni Mishra to come. He's one of the behind TPAC and knowledge. Uh, so he's going to fly in Wednesday afternoon and then Thursday in the Hinkley Center at 11 o'clock, he'll give his the annual lecture. So come for that. Uh, he's excited to be here and we're really excited to have him and to be really good, especially uh, since our department was the one who recommended uh, him for the lecture this year to have as many of us show up as possible. Now, if any of you have a con, yeah, it will not be broadcast. It's, and we'll send out a, a notice over Canvas uh, as an announcement again to remind you. But if any of you do have a conflict, because this is not the typical time, Wednesdays at noon, um, will you let me know privately and we'll work out some other alternative uh, assignment for you. But this is really a, a, a remarkable speaker that we'll have come in. That's actually in our area and in our field. So we'll support the Benjamin Clough Lecture as our seminar next week. Tyler? <clears throat>